somebody going to play the open? Isn't that the way it works? Isn't there an open to this show? This is great. No one's around, so I have to do everything myself. Let's run the open. All right, now, everybody, quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind, but we're going to have a show. Yeah, you're damn right. I just did it myself. I just turned the thing on and I hit play and uh, and it worked. Thanks, Tony. Tony was uh, busy putting something else together for us. And Kim, I don't know where she was. Kim, how are you? So all I did was just move ahead. You know, I'm practicing for the future, everyone, when it's just going to be me. That's the, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, because in the end, who can you count on? You can count on yourself. There you Aww, go. Oh, uh, Mark Thompson, I love yeah. you. Yeah, well, I mean, love's not going to be enough to get this done, Kim. You know, you're, Girl, you just woo. you're going to have to step it up. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I'm that's not, not fake. Yeah. That's real. I love a Monday. It is the middle of Mark's madness. We've got a real big, cool show today. A lot of guests coming through. A lot of controversy today. And, of course, breaking Trump news. And, um, well... There's never been anything like this. I just want to be a rich white guy in America, everybody. <laughs> That's the justice system for me. Yeah. So, uh... Chuck Todd bites the hand that feeds him. It's great. And there's a lot of really cool stuff. In fact, Tony's putting together a little bit of the media reaction... To Ronna McDaniel, we talked about her last week and her debut as an NBC commentator. And she now has, I would say, a 10-foot pole marks all over her. I mean, nobody really wants to embrace the decision and the reaction both at that network, NBC, and around the spectrum of, uh, shall we say, mainstream to liberal, clear-thinking pundits has been pretty intense, and we'll play some of that for you in a little while. Uh, there is Trump news. We'll get to that, of course. Uh, it's, again, a guy who has benefited from delays and from playing the system, totally gaming the system. One of the things I most enjoy, and then I'll get kind of a better sense for you of what to expect on the show. We've got some really cool guests coming through. But one of the things I enjoy is when someone who has benefited immensely from a system set up to take care of him, you know, as I say, a rich, entitled white guy starts that crap about how the system's out to get me, when it's out to get me, it's out to get you. If this could happen to me, it could happen to you. No, it's so not. <laughs> he's received every benefit. And this guy is now getting another break. So we'll get to Trump and his reduced bond in just a moment. Trump attorney says appellate ruling on civil fraud bond is a great first step <laughs> <laughs> toward a reversal in the whole judgment. No. Well, the, um, the case is pretty damning. We will review it this week, I'm sure, from time to time. David Katz will be in later this week with the pure X's and O's of the law. David K. Johnston will be in tomorrow with the X's and O's of the law and the politics and also the wriggle work that Trump does to wriggle out of uh, many of these things. But uh, anyway, that's uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. That's later in the week. Uh, smash the like button like, you, uh, with your iron rod. like the big boss you are. And I will tell you what's on the show. Bottom of the hour, Courtney's here with True Crime Corner. Tom Jacobson will join. He is the lawyer who won a case for the families in the Jeffrey Dahmer murders, killings. I mean, that was, you know, one of the most high-profile serial killing sprees that had cannibalism associated with it. It's a really an ugly gross. story. Yeah. Um, the story of Jeffrey Dahmer himself is a fascinating, ugly one, too. I mean, he, mm -hmm. uh, of 
what you might expect, a home where, you know, no kid coming out of that home had a chance. I'm not making an explanation or excuse for him even. I'm just kind of trying to put it into a context. And when this guy was turned loose on the, um, on the community that, you know, that also couldn't get a break, he became a savage. And uh, Courtney will be here and she will take us through some of that. But she'll do it with the help of Tom Jacobson, who, as I say, is the lawyer for the Dahmer families. And he has a lot to say about the new, uh, I think, is it a Netflix show or Hulu yeah. show? or Yeah. It's a Netflix series about the the Dahmer killings. And I think it also has a lot to do with how... Who profits from these things, right? Exactly. And exactly. whether it's the family members that, because uh, he won a big judgment for the family members in this case, and so who who profits from these things? And should it be the criminals' family? Should it be the victims' families? Should it be the network? How does that all work out? That's exactly what he wants yeah. to talk about. So I'm glad yeah. that you you pointed out because I think that's really right on point. It's mm. uh, it's a compelling story. In fact, it's, I think, one of the most viewed series in the history of that network. But oh, wow. the question then becomes, isn't there something less than holy about cashing those checks, yep. at least with, with nothing going to the mm -hmm. families of the victims? Anyway, uh, so there's that. Then the new book, Suspicious Activity, is fascinating. I'll just summarize it by saying it's a a nexus of terrorism, of money laundering, and American banks, and also um, weapons, these IED kind of weapons and the damage they do and the real victims associated with it. It's a, a book that's, it's a novel, but it's woven through this novel, all of this real life. So you learn a lot as you read the novel. It's uh, fascinating. So uh, all of that is, uh, is coming up, and uh, that and more I have... Uh, the Mark Thompson Show. I also have a law and disorder that's pretty fat. I've got a lot of Trump news. I have, um, I have some notable passings too. So I, I hope we get to all of this. But if not, we'll, uh, if not, we'll just stay on the air till we get this stuff done. Damn it, that's what we're gonna <laughs> do. Yeah. Um, one of the most exciting things before I get to um, a couple of details on the Trump situation, and then we get to the situation with Ronna McDaniel. Uh, one of the most exciting things that's going to happen today is... Of now, Mark's, Mark's, Mark's Madness! Mark's Madness! You're right. The number one seed is going off today. You'll vote for either this... Good day, sir! Yeah, or... Sayonara, sucker! Oh, the number one seed... Good day, sir! ...plays off against... Sayonara, sucker! You vote... That's tough. It, in the live chat right now and in the community section of our YouTube channel till midnight tonight. Wow, it's uh, pretty great. Man. And how about this? Speaking of greatness, yeah, Tony's watching the uh, tally for us. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my hair is lumpy today. I don't really spend a lot of time on the... My days on television have, are over, <laughs> so I don't really... You just get me as you get me. Sorry about that. Maud Day, what up, Maud? Big supporter of the MTS. Big shout out. Big shout out to Maud. How about that? $30. 30 for 30 thou in advance. Hooray. Yeah. Big, Big shout, shout out, out Maud. Yeah, we're closing in on 30,000 subscribers on this channel, which may, if you're kicking around YouTube, not seem like a lot to you, because I know a lot of YouTube channels have a tremendous number of subscribers, mm -hmm. but as Maud is right to sort of celebrate. We started and continue to be this homegrown show uh, born of a big talk radio station in the Bay Area. KGO is what they're called. They're not, they don't exist anymore. Essentially, they, uh, they were run by a uh, collective, uh, you know, corporate uh, ownership. And they just, uh, from a bottom line standpoint, they got rid of everybody. They went automated with what is uh, sports gambling. And so all of us who are doing you know, politics and news centric shows, um, we decided to come over here to YouTube. And so it was all we could do to get to a thousand and then two thousand and five. We had no way to tell our audience where we were. 
You know, we had a pretty successful radio show in San Francisco, and yet we couldn't bring that audience over. So through your sharing on Facebook, et cetera, you share various videos, you'll share a short, whatever, you get the word out to many people who don't know where we are, and those people slowly come over. In addition, there are other people who don't care or didn't know about KGO Radio. They're just happy to be here as part of this channel. And most of all, we're kept on the air by people like Maud, who throw us money. I mean, it is a this is truly a, a crowdfunded show all the way. So you can visit us at the MarkThompsonShow.com, click the Patreon or PayPal link, but you can also click the Patreon or PayPal link underneath any video, and you can see us that way as well. So uh, in other words, you can get to Patreon and PayPal, or as Maud did, Hit us with a super chat or super sticker and uh, get us a big shout big out. Big shout out. Yeah. I so appreciate. Maud has been one of our supporters from the mm. early days, as so many of you have been. And you guys are the reason we're here. So um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Tony, I'm trusting that everything is uh, going okay. Levels are okay. Uh, aside from the fact that you're overworked and underslept, things are okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Everything is going extremely well. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. The Mark Thompson Show. The Trump bond has been lowered to 175 million. Everyone. He is appealing his civil fraud judgment in New York, as you know, and the New York Appeals Court has given Donald Trump 10 more days to post this bond, as he is appealing this judgment. And they've cut the amount substantially to $175 million. It had been $464 million. That was including interest. So, again, the judge has already ruled on this case. This is in some case that still has to come down. Judge Arthur Engeron said and ruled that Trump and his co-defendants fraudulently inflated value associated with assets within the Trump organization, right? But this whole judgment today, that is to say the appeals judgment, uh, essentially it staves off the prospect of his stuff being seized by Letitia James, the New York Attorney General. So, I mean... He says he will pay it. He does intend to pay the 175. Yeah, right. Yeah. That, that he's got on him, probably. But um, he was saying before, I mean, he said a couple of things, right? He's on... The record saying, I've got the money, no problem, no matter what the amount is, I've got it. Then he's got uh, also the record saying, my client can't pay this. He doesn't have the mm -hmm. money. So he's lawyers saying that. So in any case, now we're at $175 million, And uh, as Kim has noted, he's saying, don't sweat it. I got that. It's in my other pants. Let me go get that. And that's where that sits. Um, and this blocks the penalties in the judgment, but um, it does leave the monitor in place at the Trump organization. Does it make him look, I don't know, to the people that found it important that he had oodles of cash, does it make them think, oh, he doesn't have that money? Is he lying? Or does it make him like, I don't know, fall a little bit in their eyes? I don't no. think so. I don't think no. there's any falling. I mean, I think mm -hmm. those people who are, you know, Trumpies are Trumpies no matter what. They'll yeah. be with them through thick and thin. As I've said before, I wish all of you and I wish all of us the kind of love that Trumpies <laughs> have for Donald Trump in our yeah. own lives. I, I, I want, you know, I don't know that any of us have it, regardless of how strong your bond is with your wife or husband or partner. Anyway, that's the latest. He's got 10 days to post that. And as Kim says, he um, he likely uh, will post that. Yeah. So, yeah. I the Mark Thompson Show. Oh, yeah. But meantime, the hush money trial goes on. Again, if you're uh, playing with the Trump court game board there in your, you know, in your home, you want to move the pieces to the hush money trial. Um, the... Um, the hush money trial now has a date, right? They have a date. I think it's April. Where is it? Now I don't have it. 25th or something. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me. Um, April 15th. 15th I thought it was. rather. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. April 15th. Mm -hmm. So 
the judge in the hush money trial is putting that on the docket for April 15th. Now, uh, I'll just remind you, and then we will move on from this, but I wanted to get the quick Trump news out. Uh, I'll remind you that um, essentially two things were going on. Trump was trying to get rid of this. Trump and his attorneys were saying, hey, let's get rid of this case completely. And the judge said, no, we're not going to get rid of this case completely. By the way, that's a pretty standard request, so it, there's nothing extraordinary about that. Uh, but the other thing that the Trump lawyers were trying to do was delay the Trump trial on this hush money case even further. So in other words, uh, we just got all these documents, you know, that whole story with Alvin Bragg and the documents, and we've got, you know, we've got thousands of pages of documents to go through. And there were some questions as to why there was a delay in those documents, but more to the point. Uh, and one of the things that was said was, well, there were only 300 legit factual uh, additions to it all, even though it looks like thousands, a lot of it was, you know, replicative of other stuff. So you end up with this big stack of documents, but the reality is there's a very small amount that's really new. But still, there are new documents, and that's the reason that there was a delay. So now the, to the point of the delay and how long the delay is, the Trump uh, uh, lawyers want a long delay. You know, we, we, it's going to take us months to go through all these. You know, So they wanted three months, and the judge gave them 30 days, gave them one month. And essentially, the judge is saying, now, look, we're going to do this, kids. April 15th is when we start. So well, This was the only this it will be the only case to happen or start before the election. And this is the case yeah. that I like the least in a mm -hmm. way. Um, be, I mean, I get it. It's a porn star and it's all of that. T -t -t -t, you know what? You know, if but, nobody cares about the grab them by the pee comment, then no one cares about a porn star situation. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I mean, yeah. we already know he's a sleaze bag, and clearly no one cares about his you know, the way he treats women. We've already shown that. Don't that's talk not to me word. that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you should watch what yeah. you say here, Kim. But if mm -hmm. you, um, I mean, I just. Uh, that was very inappropriate. I agree, <laughs> sir. I, I didn't say it. It was uh, Kim. She's yeah. she's really getting. Uh, My bad, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, you think you're getting a little mouthy, if I can oh. uh, say that. Yeah, yeah. No. Where is my chit chit chit? Is what I was oh. looking for. Oh yeah, ch -ch -ch there it is. Give yeah, me yeah, a live yeah. one. Yeah, chit chit yeah, chit. Yeah, really chit chit. Ch -ch -chit. Yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, just because we hear chit chit chit, in the second hour today, chit chit chit, which is picked by many in Mark's Madness to go all the way. Wow. To Impressive. win. Yeah. Chit 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 will play off in its first showdown in Mark's Madness. And this will be what? I know it's going off against that's not fake. The Fauci drop. So that's uh -huh. going to happen next hour, though. Don't get listen. This hour, it's a yeah. good day, sir, versus Cheyenne sucker. Good day, sir. Yeah, versus Cheyenne sucker. Yeah, you vote for one or the other. And here's a quick check of the leaderboard. Good day, sir, is ahead of Cheyenne sucker. Really? 65% oh, to 35%. Ooh. Exactly. Again, you vote in the chat. You don't have to have a bracket. You can just vote on the the drop that you think should move on to the next round. And you can use whatever criteria you want. I mean, you know, some people go, I think this is the best drop, it's the most versatile drop. Or you're gonna say, I just don't, I just like this drop more. Doesn't matter, you don't have to think in terms of a show producer. You can, uh, anyway, that's the, uh, that's the latest on Trump, on his trials, on the timing, on the money, and uh, we will watch it for you. And as it develops even through the show, we'll continue to update it. The Mark Thompson Show. Now, there was a lot of blowback this weekend over a decision on the part of NBC, we told you about it last week, to hire Ronna McDaniel as an analyst. She's a, the former RNC head, right? She was the RNC head under Trump. She rode the RNC train while Trump was president. And she essentially played the election lie and all the other Trump stuff uh, through his tenure as president. And so she just stepped down, as you know, to make room for a Trump family member. Trump family members always have a better sense of what uh, an organization should be doing. And so they bumped McDaniel and she floated around and ended up at NBC News.
And NBC News hires her as this political commentator, like uh, Chris Christie was hired by ABC on that panel, like Donna Brazile is hired by ABC as well. So it's not unprecedented to have somebody like Ronna McDaniel show up on the panel. The unprecedented part is sort of the new political environment in which we live, which is associated with somebody who's an election denier, somebody who is, uh, was strong-arming or at least on the call from Trump that strong-armed Georgia election officials. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a bridge too far to have someone like that on the panel. So at NBC News, there was huge blowback. I mean, everybody was uh, surprised by this hire and then appalled by this hire and then repulsed by this hire. And you ended up on the air with people like Chuck Todd, who's their political director and the former host of Meet the Press, saying on Meet the Press, this was a bad idea. Tony's got a mashup of some stuff over the weekend in reaction, uh, I think, this morning as well. Go ahead, Tony, please. With the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. Well, I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? But once at the RNC, she did say that, hey, I'm speaking for the party. I get that. That's part of the job. So what about here? I, I will say this. I think your interview uh, did a good job of exposing, I think, many of the contradictions. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. So it is, it, you know, that's where you begin here. So I do think, unfortunately, this interview is always going to be looked through the prism of right. who is she speaking for, right. Right? right? I think you did everything you could do. You got put into an impossible situation yeah. booking this interview, and then all of a sudden the rugs pull out from under you. You find out she's being paid to show up. That's, that's unfortunate for this program, but I am glad you did the best that you could. Yeah. I think it continues, right, Tony? Or no? Uh, no? The hiring of former RNC. No. Sorry, that's all I got. That's all I. Got. Okay, that's cool. That was that was a good little, a uh, drill down on uh, what is that? What, what is that? Morning that Joe. That was the, or the yeah the other one you sent me. Play a little bit of that. This is the other reaction. I'm just trying to give folks a sense of the reaction. Yeah. So these guys Steve are uh, on Ron MS, and obviously, obviously. Well, uh, she was on Sunday's Meet the Press. It was her first appearance since the NBC and since NBC News hired her as a political analyst. Uh, I know you. Won't be surprised to know that we've been inundated with calls this weekend, as have uh, most people connected with this network, about NBC's decision to hire her. Uh, we learned about the hiring when we read about it in the press on Friday. Uh, we weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it for several re reasons, uh, including, but not limited to, as lawyers might say, Ms. McDaniel's role in Donald Trump's fake elector scheme and her pressuring election officials to not certify election results while Donald Trump was on the phone. To be clear, we believe NBC News should seek out conservative Republican voices to provide balance in their election coverage, but it should be conservative Republicans, not a person who used her position of power to be an anti-democracy election denier, and we hope NBC will reconsider its decision. Okay, that's it goes good. without you. saying that, you, you that get a will. You get a sense for it. So it didn't go down well. Um, McDaniel said she was kind of towing the line. She, uh, in, in conversation with, with Welker, was asked about her election denying, and she sort of said, I was towing the line for taking one for the team, is what she literally said. So you, you get, um, I mean... The other thing that is, I think, important about Ronna McDaniel is that she was attacking the press. When Trump continues to call the, the press the enemy of the people, I mean, it, you know, the, there are real people involved in the press and bringing information to us. And those people are fearing for their lives oftentimes in some of these environments in which they are demonized and talked about as enemies of the state. I mean, this is a 
it's a classic yeah. strongman move. How and do you fight Ronna against McDaniel, the truth? Yeah, right? and, and, and yeah, and Ronna McDaniel was not only backing that up, but she was amplifying it. So what's that, Kim? I said, how do you fight against the truth? How yeah. do you fight against true stories that are coming out? You d try to discredit. You do anything you can to discredit the people who are telling you the truth. And, it, and it's been effective. I mean, the mm -hmm. uh, the faith in media is way, way down. But more to the point, and this is something that has really been, and I want to talk to David K. Johnson a little bit about this tomorrow. This has really been taken advantage of, if that's a way you can say it, uh, by uh, the Trump team and continues to be by the Republicans who sort of want to dismantle government. The trust in government is at an all-time low in the modern age. So you end up with uh, government not being trusted. So it's much easier to dismantle those institutions that are associated with uh, regulatory protections, etc., because no one is trusting anything. And then you also add the press to that so that all the information becomes suspect. And you can see we're in, a, we're in a situation, but a lot of it, the gaslighting associated with this and the um, the way in which the government and press is characterized has been pounded into us by Trump and Ronna McDaniel, who was really doing Trump's bidding while she was head of the RNC. So, um, anyway, that's uh, the latest on that. And you know, I don't know if she's going to make it. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of blowback. I mean. Um, sometimes controversy is good for you. You know, the more blowback and more controversial a decision is, it can oftentimes bring more attention and more viewers to the screen. And I don't know if this falls into that category. The Mark Thompson Show. I did want to mention one thing, because as long as I'm talking about losing trust in certain things, I don't want to seem as though I would ever ignore this, because I think this is a pretty big deal. Um, you know, I believe that one of the things that we didn't do that we need to do as a nation is actually impanel a committee or blue ribbon panel on how COVID was handled, on the last, how the last pandemic was handled. But it has to really be done in a serious way. Mm -hmm. The grandstanding associated with a lot of the stuff that they're doing now, where they're, you know, they're, do, they're, they're trying to light up Biden through all of these impeachment proceedings, et cetera, it's not only a waste of time and taxpayer money, but it's it's such a pure political jihad that I, I just... So apart from that, I'd like something really done on COVID because I think there's a lot to be learned. You know, when you talk about COVID restrictions and, and we can talk about COVID and let's put a slash there and say pandemic, because I'm really doing it for the next pandemic, right? COVID has receded a bit and it still represents a, a danger, I think, to certain sectors of the population. But more to the point, uh, as a society, we're going to have to deal with the uh, next pandemic. So I would love a blue ribbon panel, whatever, uh, uh, put together to look at COVID. So among the things they would look at would be you know, uh, treatments for COVID, vaccines, uh, uh, social distancing, masks, etc. The closing of schools, the closing of businesses, all of these things should be looked at dispassionately and reported on. So here is something that would fall into that category. And again, uh, you'll pardon me for, again, not necessarily singing the song that is always played when it comes to the discussion of ivermectin, that drug that was used to treat many people with COVID. And it was talked about in all of these ways that smeared it, and it was talked about as a horse medication. Now, I don't know. I'm not an MD. I don't know. I just know that, wow, the, the medical community really came out against it, and the FDA came out against it, right? So, and the FDA was on the record. They warned Americans not to use ivermectin. It was, quote, intended for animals. Never use medications intended for animals on yourself or other people, they said. Animal uh, ivermectin products are very different from those approved for humans. So they were also saying, don't use the animal ivermectin if you're going to use the ivermectin, because people are going to, you'll remember, they were going to these various concerns that are associated with horse medications, and they were buying them for themselves. It was a crazy time in America, which is really why I'd like this uh, x-ray on how we did. But now to the news. The... Federal lawsuit against the U.S. Department of uh, 
Health and Human Services and the Food and Drug Administration over the agency's attempts to block the use of ivermectin in COVID-19 treatment. Uh, the FDA lost that case. I mean, it's pretty big news. An FDA reversal on ivermectin. And the lawsuit is now forcing the FDA to remove COVID-19 related ivermectin posts. The federal agency agreed to remove social media posts about use of the drug in a court approved agreement with this doctor, Dr. Mary Bowden. It's a huge, huge chapter. And as I say this, and I'm going to call it, even though it's not technically over post COVID world. FDA publications and actions cited by the plaintiffs include a 2021 post with pictures of a horse captioned, you are not a horse, you are not a cow, mm. seriously, y'all, stop it, and a link to an agency article, this is again, FDA article, entitled, Why You Should Not Take Ivermectin to Treat or Prevent COVID-19. And this doctor sued one of thousands of doctors who was scrambling for treatment options and she found this one ivermectin and again she took the fda to court and she won so that's a win in the southern district court in texas um and uh there was an overruling in the case and it and it was appealed but essentially um once all of the appeals and the uh, throwing it down to the lower court and all of that was done, uh, the FDA now has to remove many of these social media posts. Houston doctor's lawsuit forces FDA to remove COVID-19 related ivermectin posts. Wow. There it is in the Texan. Again, the uh, case going down in Texas. So that's the latest on that. The Mark Thompson Show. I know I'm running late. I'm running late. It's like what we're always doing. We're running late. Courtney's here. And I've got a red hot Mark's now, Madness. I Mark's Madness. I can't believe it either. I really can't. We got the number one seed going off right now, everybody. It's either Good Day, sir. And a good day, sir, is going off against Zion or a sucker. Yeah, that's right. You vote for either Good Day, sir. Or Zion or a sucker. Vote for one or the other. Only one drop makes it to the next round. And you can vote until midnight tonight in the community section of our YouTube channel. So go for it. All right. Um, do I have time for Kim's news? What are we doing here, guys? I don't do I have think time? so. I think we should no? jump right into it, and then I'll do news afterward. All right. I think that that is a once again. Kim, how are you? Kim makes a mature decision. You can tell she's a mom, you know, because <laughs> mothers make mature decisions, I well, think. Yeah, we and have And that to. was a mature decision. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I need more m maturity on this show, and I'm going to maybe turn to Kim more, Courtney. Don't you think I should do that to, uh, uh, let me, um, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, Courtney yeah, is playing hurt. Courtney is sick. Oh, no. Under the yeah, weather. Yeah, she's under the weather. Now, she, um, yeah. uh, you know, she oftentimes gets up pretty much every day. Is she greets the day with, uh, I'm so tired. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I only slept four hours. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I, and yeah. I always respond with, oh, yeah. I haven't slept in six and a half years, and I feel great. Let's get going, all right? <laughs> it's that Coachella Valley coffee that he has very early in the morning. Pretty Gets terrific. It's pretty <laughs> terrific. It. It's a great pick-me-up. But now she adds, in addition to fatigue, uh, um, I'm a little under the weather. Infirmity, yeah. You're yeah. Really... But I spent a lot of my weekend... Um, with the Dahmer thing? Yeah, with Dahmer. And okay. I really wanted to have a conversation with You Tom. did, yeah. And we've got a very high-profile guest. So uh, Tom Jacobson joins us next. This is True Crime Corner. Let's pay a visit to Mark's True Crime Corner. This is not a good neighborhood. I'm scared. Now, here's your host, Mark Thompson. Well, I'd like to welcome uh, Courtney in. She's the regular, as you know, abiding Hello. interest in true crime. And the gentleman you see there is Thomas Jacobson. Tom, who I, I'm sure doesn't like to be called Tom. Maybe you do. Tom, am I, can I call you Tom or not? Absolutely. Ah, oh, there you go. How about it? All right. Um, he is an attorney who worked on behalf of the victim's families in the Jeffrey Dahmer murders to get them financial compensation. And I should say he worked... Um, 
quite successfully uh, won the case for, uh, I believe it was eight of the families, was it, Tom? Yes. Yeah, eight of the families. And Courtney, you point out um, in relation to Tom Jacobson, our guest today, that he's particularly incensed by this series that uh, I guess has become very popular. And he's thinking, and I'll let Tom speak also, but I just, Courtney was really sharing with me how uh, Thomas Jacobson feels that some of those monies that are associated with this series should go to uh, the families, the victims' families. Yeah, and I... um. I can let Thomas speak to that. I believe there was a letter written to the rap um, that we can talk about. But I I also know that um, Thomas's work goes back to the beginning of these crimes and the profiting that was happening over the course of many years, including um, some of the homes in which some of the criminal activity took place and some of the things that were taken from the apartment when ultimately uh, Jeffrey Dahmer was arrested, I believe, July 23rd, 1991. What about that, Thomas? What what, what, what does that refer to? I, I didn't realize that things were taken from the home. All right. Well, basically, you had to start by getting judgments. And so uh, the first lawsuit I got was shortly after Dahmer's uh, crimes were discovered in 1991. Uh, the first person that retained me when we brought the lawsuit suing Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, I would be willing to sue for any of the families, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer personally. But other than the Loatian youngster that uh, was the uh, young man that uh, Dahmer had encountered on the street after he had left his apartment and the ladies had been telling the police that were on the scene, they had called him that uh, Dahmer had molested this young man they actually let that young man go back to Dahmer's apartment with Dahmer where he murdered him later. But uh, that was the one case you could sue the city, which was a deep pocket. Other than that, all the other lawsuits I felt were too remote, and I would only sue Dahmer. So the first case was against Dahmer. And again, with the press, the most that they're interested in when you file these civil lawsuits, how much are you suing for? Well, our lawsuit was for three billion. So when the headline hit the papers that Dahmer was sued for three billion, all the families that were looking for lawyers saw that headline, and of course they called one another. Said, Did you "See the article, this one lawyer is suing for three billion. You should hire him." So that's how we got eight of the families to represent them. When we got over eighty million in judgments. Then the question became. How do you collect the judgment against Jeffrey Dahmer, who claimed he didn't have two nickels to rub together? I did his deposition in prison. I actually questioned Dahmer at Columbia Correctional Institutions to ask, I could only ask him about how are you going to pay these judgments. My thought was that I would try to talk him into doing a book about himself, telling him I got to be, you know, so sick and disgusting in terms of what he did to all of his victims. There were 17 victims of his serial murder onslaught. And uh, then what we would do is have him, I would sell the interview and I would uh, videotape him as he talked about what he did. And I actually came out here to LA, got a million dollar uh, contract on the table. But then Dahmer's father, he wanted the money. He wrote the book. He got $150 million from Morrow as an advance for the book. What? About he got $150 million? $150,000. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, for, for the uh, advance for the book. That's still uh, outrageous. But still, yeah, it was outrageous. Yeah. Uh, everybody was exploiting the story. If you remember back to those days, you know, there were trading cards. There were comic books. There were uh, books, there were movies, all these attempts to exploit the families to make money off the tragedy of what Dahmer had done to the victims. Can you? Can I just take a moment here and ask you, Tom, you are so close to these families. Um, give me a sense of, uh, we, I think we have an idea kind of the same way we do Charles Manson about this guy who, you know, is so awful. We know he, his victims 
were lured in, I guess, and then there's cannibalism and all this stuff. But I, I think the real sense of precisely what happened, we probably can't go through the whole thing here, but give me a sense of these victims, since you directly represent their families, who they were, the kind of person they were. What was the profile of the sort of victim that would fall into Dahmer's world? Well, they were mostly gay. They were all minorities. Uh, they were poor. Uh, a lot of them were hustlers. I mean, Dahmer did get them at gay bars. He uh, got them on street corners. He would offer money to come pose at his apartment. And then once he lured them to his apartment, he would uh, drug them. And then uh, after they passed out, uh, he wanted to control them. And the way he did that was he decapitated them. He basically kept their body parts or skulls. Every, I mean, it was pretty disgusting what he did. Uh, with that Loatian youngster that he did on the street, he actually lobotomized that young man before he murdered him. So uh, it was very traumatic for the families. Can I ask uh, also another uh, another question, Corey? Sure. Maybe you can speak to this. Um, how can this guy do all of this stuff? Uh, weren't there neighbors? Wasn't there? It, were, it's a weird fact that nobody else is aware of this, even like, a, as I say, somebody else lived in an adjoining apartment type thing. Oh, no, they, there were complaints. Uh, the neighbor of Dahmer's, uh, there was a terrible smell that was coming out of his apartment from the bodies that had been decomposed, and they complained uh, to the uh, apartment manager. I interviewed the apartment manager, and he said Dahmer always had a plausible, you know, uh, excuse that a rat had gotten in and decomposed or that uh, fish had uh, decomposed that he had failed to throw out. Uh, and they had spoiled. So he had all of these very uh, plausible excuses for what he did. He was he was actually stopped on two or three occasions by the police. The first time he was stopped, he had the body had uh, in a in a sack on the back seat of his car. He was stopped for going over the center line. And uh, he was able to talk to the police. They never looked in the back seat, and they let him go. They gave him a ticket, and that was all that happened to him. And another occasion, uh, basically, there was a complaint of uh, a person that had actually escaped from him after he had had him in his apartment. He had complained to the police. Uh, when the police came, Dahmer, again, he gave an explanation of what happened, and the police bought it. With the Loatian youngster, he went back to the apartment with him, and the police followed him. Dahmer showed him pictures showing that they were lovers, and they bought into that it was a lover's bed. If they'd looked in the kitchen in the uh, refrigerator, they would have seen the body parts still in the refrigerator. I mean, he wow. thought wow. Dahmer, you know, when I deposed him, it was like he didn't miss a beat. Out of that deposition, we came up with three ideas as how we could get money from him. One was we had tried to talk him into doing the book, which, of course, he wouldn't do later because of the father. Secondly, we determined when we questioned him, you know, I was asking him about his assets. It's like a debtor-creditor kind of thing that I was engaged in. Uh, and basically, I'm asking him what his non-exempt assets are that could satisfy the 80 million in judgments I had against him. We find out that he had a bank account with $12,000 in it. People from all over the world sent him money. A gal from London sent him over $6,000. Her hustle was basically for her sending him money, he would send her correspondence, and then she turned around and sold that correspondence. Oh my so the God. tabloids in London for huge sums oh. of money and profit. I mean, everybody was exploiting the story for money. Where the money came from was when I determined that, uh, again, it was just like an epiphany. You know, I'm questioning Don Brown's assets. Well, I've got this AM radio. I've got, you know, a lava lamp. I've got this or that in my apartment. All of a sudden, boom, Jeffrey Dahmer's Dahmer lamp. Jeffrey Dahmer's Emory, those have to have value. He had the police that, when they arrested him, took all of 312 items out of his apartment. They inventoried it, so this would authenticate whatever was on that inventory. 
was for real, and I then went ahead and seized those assets. I had a receiver appointed to get uh, those assets to satisfy my judgment. So that, you know, it's strictly debtor-creditor kind of a thing. You know, well, like, I, I going, like, one, like uh, New York is going after Trump to get their money for <laughs> the investment that he engaged in in New York with his assets. You know, you use the tools that are available to get money out of these deadbeats. So basically I mean, just, what happened was when yeah. we got all, finally, and it, it was a struggle, but we convinced the judge to give us all those assets, and then we said we were going to have an auction. We're going to sell off these assets to the highest bidder. And that's when the philanthropist in Milwaukee, by the name of Joe Zilber, came forward. He contacted me. What would I ask to get all of these assets into his position, into his possession to destroy? And I said a million non-negotiable, and we ended up accepting uh, $420,000. That was divided then amongst 11 of the families, though I represented eight. Three others came in. I'd always said no matter what money was generated, it would be split equally among all, all the families of the victims. And my wife, interestingly enough, after all this went down, it took five years, I told her, you know, honey, I'm finally think this is over and we're going to finally see some money for all this effort we put into getting money for these Dahmer victim families. And she said, you're not going to take one dime of that money. And we, and I thought it was a good idea. We gave it all to charity. Well, you, you, I wanted to make this point. Thomas Jacobson didn't take a dime of the settlement for his legal efforts. That's extraordinary, I think. And it, it really bears. There's over 80,000 that we were entitled to. And you know, what was interesting, uh, the media just crucified me when I made these efforts to get the victim families money. They crucified remember, you how, the profile Tom? profile of those families, remember, they were gay and they were minorities. Right, that's so what they I was were not, earlier. Nobody was sympathetic to them. Everybody was really quite critical of their efforts to try and get any money for this. You know, it was blood money. You know, it's disgusting that they want to profit off of what happened to their loved one. Uh, so the media just, any time I came up with an idea, they whapped me editorially. I mean, there was big, it was very controversial what I did. Uh, and it's interesting, if you compare what I did with the Dahmer victims in the uh, Jeffrey Dahmer victim story, uh, and compare that to O.J. Simpson when he murdered those families, uh, the, the, the two people that he killed. When they went after uh, O.J. Simpson, to get money for what he did to them, everybody was off, you know, this beautiful blonde a wife of his that was murdered. And, you know, there was all this sympathy for the families and go. And uh, what did they do to get money out of OJ? They seized all of his memorabilia and made money off of that. They were applauded for that. When I did the same thing in the Diver case, you would have thought, you know, one editorial said, I ought to be run out of town on a rail for coming up with this idea. I mean, it was it was really an atmosphere yeah, that, where people were not sympathetic at all. It so reflects the racism and homophobia and uh, sort of the- Exactly, the, Mark. You hit it right on the, right on the, that's exactly what we were facing. Uh, I mean, look at the cops that turned- uh, uh, the Lewisian youngster back to Dahmer. You know what the, they were when they were going back to the station on their uh, radio. Uh, 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 and the, there was a tape where they're talking to one another, uh, saying, "Well, we have to delouse ourselves before we come back to the station." And those officers, after having done that, when they were suspended, a judge reinstated them, gave them their back pay. The police union elected one of them as the uh, uh, president of the union. They were applauded. They were given awards for what they did. Yeah, uh, that was I mean, what is a case of the seventy nine. So the cop that returned racist, the victim to him was promoted was years awful. ago. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. just awful. Uh, what's that, Courtney? Did you have anything? No, no, I was, I was just. 
agreeing it was awful what happened after that and he and Dahmer as I as I know it also attacked uh the Luatian boy's brother right who was 13. So I'm sorry that he had he had also um sexually assaulted the Luatian brother um yes read, the younger yeah. brother uh, that was and he was arrested and uh, he was put in jail for that but the judge let him out early uh, uh you know Dahmer was very good uh at conning everybody that he came in contact with was he you charming know, is that the reason what was the reason he was able to well elude? he was white you know he had uh, yeah. you know, he looked like an armani with his little beard there and you know he was very sympathetic to people uh uh we had uh i mean they have twelve thousand be donated to you for people around the world you can imagine you yeah you're right that, that kind of does speak for he it. was able to he he could talk to you in a way that uh, convinced you that what he was saying was plausible and that he was telling the truth. I mean, he no. never missed a beat when I questioned him in the deposition I took when he was in prison. No, you know, he, he tried to defend calm. himself on the basis that he wasn't sane when he murdered all these people. Thank God the jury didn't buy into that and found him sane. But yeah, he, I mean, he, he was able to sell himself. And, you know, he exploited the families. You remember the gal that, um, the sister of one of the victims that went ballistic during the sentencing of Dahmer and actually confronted him and went right into his face and was screaming and yelling at him. The, that young lady was uh, cloned in the, in the Jeffrey Dahmer story. You know, uh, Ryan Murphy and Netflix, when they put that together, they exploited the families of the victims horrendously. And that was what my letter was about. You know, uh, Rita, uh, Isabel, who was the, the uh, victim uh, sister that uh, had been cloned and, uh, you know, down to what she wore and uh, everything, they never forewarned the families that this series was gonna be talking about the families the way they did. Uh, they were all traumatized. You had Shirley Hughes, who was the mother of the uh, mute victim. She criticized uh, for not getting any warning ahead of time. Rita was just absolutely uh, plus because of what happened. I mean, she was so traumatized, seeing herself uh, like almost looking in the mirror. Uh, and of course, what they cloned was when she had the outburst against Dahmer and went face to face with him. Um, it was her outburst that motored v motivated me to write the letter to the rap criticizing um, Netflix uh, for their portrayal of, of, the, of what happened to the victim families. And, uh, and, yes, Ryan Murphy, we, what he wanted to do, he wanted to have a memorial in Milwaukee that he was willing to pay for for the, honoring the victim family. Well, you know, that's the last thing that the, there's Rita, that's Rita Isabel. That's the young lady I've been talking about that went ballistic with Dahmer, who criticized, and then I wrote the letter supporting what she did. She was my client. And uh, basically uh, what happened, uh, uh, they didn't get a dime. You know, uh, do you know that there, were, there, were, uh, there was, uh, when that series aired, uh, there was over a billion hits uh to the to the jeffrey Dahmer story that's how it was like number one every cable show uh, when that series was being run i mean it was it was just uh watched by everybody well you know true crime people they can never you know they have an in, in, insatiable appetite you know yeah for, i live with one for the uh, war <laughs> and for the you know uh bizarre and uh so basically there's a huge audience for these kind of stories. And uh, that uh, I criticized them for, first of all, it's the last thing that the families wanted was a memorial, which you should give the families is the money of the profits. Right. So you know, that was what I, you know, told Netflix to do. You so, couldn't uh, sue them. You know, that was all protected under the First Amendment. So right. there was no lawsuits right. for, you know, exploiting the families in the manner and fashion that they did. Uh, so, uh, but this is your, the thing that you're about now is trying to get 
Murphy uh, to try to get Netflix, to try to get to some small tributary of revenue for these families, just even in the sense that it would it would not right the wrongs, but it would be the right thing to do. You got it, Mark. That's exactly correct. Uh, you know, when the Emmys came out and uh, they gave the award uh, nominations, I criticized that as well, because again, here, what are you doing when you, you know, give awards to these kind of shows? I mean, I know it's controversial, uh, you know, that you go after the actors that get these kind of awards. I mean, they're trying to make a living and, you know, it is their profession. But at the same time, what you're doing is you're exploiting these victim families. You really should give notice ahead of time. Uh, you know, Kimberly Goldman, who was the sister of Ron Goldman, who was of, uh, one of uh, O.J. Symptoms victims, you know, along with uh, his, his ex-wife, uh, she was very critical because she, uh, she felt that series exploited her family. Uh, they had not been given notice or forewarning. This series was going to be talking about the families of the victims the way they did. So all of these victim families are very sensitive. Give them a heads up. Tell them ahead of time. Involve them. You know, sure. you know, I mean, it, 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 get it, some it's input just a, it's just, and and share some of the profits if there's profits with them. Don't just, just be just a, greedy and exploit them. It's basic decency, and uh, it's uh, it's on short supply, particularly in the C-suites. Um, you know. Uh, oh, you these, got it. Yeah, yeah. it's all uh, about money. But yeah. not, not for the victims. Uh, Tom, congratulations on what you're doing. Uh, it's a selfless thing that you're doing, and I appreciate you sharing some of it Well, thank uh, you for giving us. me the opportunity to talk about it on your show, Mark. Your, your show is terrific. Oh, thank you so much, sir. I That's hope the you. first thing that he said that I don't believe. <laughs> <laughs> See what I have to deal with, Tom? <laughs> Did you hear what she said? That's the first thing you said that I don't believe. Yeah, all right. She, yeah, she, you do a terrific job putting these shows together and getting the people for Mark to interview. It's a thankless thing. Yeah, staff. good job, Courtney. There you go. She yep. cracks the whip. Yeah. yeah nice Way job. to go, Courtney. Oh, yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, both of you, thank you. Thomas, Courtney, uh, appreciate it. And we hope we'll thank you, uh, Mark. meet again. It, yeah, was, it was great being on your show. That's True Crime Corner for today. True Crime Corner, only on the Mark Thompson Show. Yeah, what a... Um, yeah. He's great. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah. Wow. I can, but I can't take credit for putting people on the show. I mean, that's Kim and, and, and Albert and Tony. You know, I'm, I just um, am able to come every Monday and talk about... Well, this is no time for modesty uh, on the show, but thank you very much for... Uh, a very interesting conversation, and I thought the questions that you asked were... Really interesting as well. So well, thank you, Courtney. I hope you feel better. I know you're playing hurt. We appreciate you, oh, um, you. you being yeah. here, and yep. um, maybe some hot tea or some maybe uh, some hot Coachella, Coachella Valley tea. Coachella yeah. Valley mm -hmm. tea. I made yeah. some of the strong, super strong espresso this morning. I love this stuff. Mm. Exactly. It's quite special as well, and you're still very much alive in Mark's madness, which uh, continues. So, Courtney, everybody. Thank Yay. you for having mm -hmm. me. Yeah. And thank you, Kim. Yeah, we love seeing you. Feel better. The Mark Thompson Show. You're about to enter the second hour, and there's no uh, special uh, protective outfit you need for the second hour. There's no special uh, study that you need to do. There's no homework. There's nothing. I'm there's feeling simply... a little sad for Sayonara, sucker. Oh. What Court, what um, Kim is speaking about mm -hmm. is the fact that uh, we are in the middle of uh, Mark's madness, and... Um, sayonara sucker you want to put it up there again tony it's in the first hour of live voting we remember there's live voting in the uh, first hour and then the second hour for in each case but the thing that is yeah worth uh, focusing on is that there is continuous voting until midnight tonight in the community section of our youtube channel but right now the live voting is over as you can see the poll has ended in the chat and Good Day, Sir is running well ahead. Good Day, Sir! Yeah, Good Day, Sir is a classic. It's the number one seed, in fact. Sayonara, sucker! Ahead of Sayonara, oh. sucker. But you can vote for either one in yeah. the uh, community uh, section of our YouTube channel. Uh, right now, it's uh, hour number two. No. I can't believe it! Mark's oh, Madness! I love it! And finally, 
a top seed again going off against a seed that may not have as big a chance, but it's close. How about this? You vote for chit, 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 or you vote for... That's not fake. That's real. Again, either chit, 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 or... That's not fake. That's real. That's right. It's uh, chit, chit, chit versus that's not fake. Good luck. Wow, I'm so excited. Mark's Madness is on, and Kim's Drop is way live. In fact, many people have picked Kim's Drop to win the championship. Oh, look at it already go. Right out of the chute. Yeah. Chit, chit, chit is crushing. Chit, chit, chit. 68%. You are taking Dr. Fauci. Can you let him finish, sir? I know. <laughs> You've already lost. Uh, let him finish. That's yeah. not fake. That's real. There you go. So it's uh, chit, 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 chit. Or. Um, That's not fake. Mm. That's real. All right. So good luck. You've got till midnight tonight in the community section. But right now, the voting is live. It's crackling mm-hmm. in the live chat. The Mark Thompson Show. Yeah. All right. Now, I know we have a guest waiting. Can I just slip, slip some news in and ask the guest to wait five more minutes? Yeah, he's, uh, right? we've got two minutes till the interview is uh, scheduled to start, so I think I can throw in some news really quickly. Great. I would, there's a yeah. lot going on. I really would like to get some news. Mm-hmm. Please smash the like button like a boss. Hit us with a thumbs up. Smash it does with help your us iron the, uh, rod. It does help us. Uh, help, smash it yeah, with your iron rod. In the uh, world of YouTube. And um, we continue. Great, great hour ahead. Uh, Kim's News. As we continue, Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. This report is sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee. Dot com. And we begin with the uh, outgoing president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, was on 60 Minutes yesterday offering a proposal for ways in which the United States could lessen the number of migrants coming in at our southern border. He offered up four things that he said the U.S. government could do that could address this system where he thinks the problems begin at the political and economic issues. And here are the four things. Commit $20 billion a year to poor countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, lift sanctions on Venezuela, end the Cuban embargo, and legalize law-abiding, undocumented Mexican immigrants living in the United States. And already, Marjorie Taylor Greene is losing her ever-loving mind. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, if you really look at what he's just said and proposed Mm -hmm. it is sensible stuff some of it which has sort of been um part of policy u.s policy already for example uh funding many of these he's talking about mexico of course because that's Mm -hmm. where he was the former president but uh these various uh central american and south american countries that feed this stream of immigration trying to help them in their backyard has always been u.s policy i mean to varying degrees Mm -hmm. but uh, so uh, you know some of what he said really makes sense and uh but uh, again it's um in the new political age it's just demonized a judge is dismissing a lawsuit from elon musk against a hate speech oversight group the owner of X alleging in his case the Center for Countering Digital Hate illegally gathered data from the social media platform to report on the spread of hate speech and misinformation online. Judge Charles Breyer ruling the lawsuit sought to punish the uh, Center for Countering Digital Hate. He wrote, Musk's complaint is so unabashedly and vociferously about one thing that there can be no mistaking that purpose. No. Oh. Yeah, a lot of ding words in there, I'm going to tell you. Yeah, I know. They were, they were written, though. Mm. That's why I didn't ding them. Okay, I Vo- I'll, I'll ding vociferous, Joe, okay. just, to, just to make the point, though. Okay. Yeah. A Texas judge is blocking Attorney General Ken Paxton, featured here, from accessing the records of a civil rights group that helps families find information about transgender health care. Lindley Egyes is the attorney for PFLAG, which has been fighting the request. Uh, she says the records request is a bullying tactic. Families will be less likely to seek advice if they know their names could be leaked to the attorney general's office. Texas has a new state law banning puberty blockers, hormone treatments, and any gender-related surgery for minors. Today's temporary injunction lasts until the June trial date, and so that is going on in Texas. Well, that guy you see right there, Ken Paxton, he is dirty. 
He was, they attempted to impeach him in Texas. He's the Texas Attorney General again. Um, there was a lot of, without getting into all the, the weeds on it, there was a lot of evidence that was essentially building up against him, uh, ab accusing him in the impeachment thing of abusing his office, protecting political donors, this kind of thing. So they brought impeachment proceedings against him. Now, to be fair, they he was cleared okay but i mean you've got it was a it was contentious and it's not clear that even the vote to clear him was legit just like the vote to clear donald trump you know on his impeachment you you get how um impeachment managers and uh, impeachment proceedings can be informed by other things besides evidence anyway this guy paxton is bad news man and he is uh he's the texas uh, state attorney general that's a creepy story this man is behind bars on suspicion of taking a severed lower leg from the site of a deadly crane crash happened in Kern County. You can see him here. He's looking for it on the sidewalk. Uh, it happened last week after this Amtrak train hit and killed a pedestrian in Wasco, north of Bakersfield. A viral social media video shows a man walking down the street carrying what appears to be a severed leg and foot. At one point in the video, he bends over and appears to sniff it. He's facing several charges now. Another 11 California counties will be getting help to recover from the February storms. Governor Gavin Newsom expanding last month's state of emergency to include Alameda, Butte, Glen, Lake, Mendocino, Monterey, Sacramento, San Francisco, Santa Cruz, Sonoma, and Sutter counties. Five of them are also part of his request for a presidential major disaster declaration due to widespread flooding and mudslides. The other four, uh, Los Angeles, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. So all over California, it's a big thing. I, I would like to tell you that, but, uh, and I'll wrap it up because I know we have our guest, but there's a big statement supposedly coming from Shohai Otani regarding this whole situation with his interpreter pictured here. He's set to address this gambling scandal, and he'll do it publicly today. Major League Baseball says it has launched a formal investigation into this matter. Otani's interpreter is accused of receiving more than $4.5 million from the Dodger superstar to pay off gambling debts made with an illegal bookie. What he's got going here is a situation. <laughs> he does have a situation. There's no question. Uh, we'll talk about this. I've spoken about it already, but I will talk more about it. I think, I, I think, no matter, I'll just say this, no matter what, and I think there's a lot of what here, okay? Mm -hmm. These stories have changed. It's very possible that the guy you see on the right who was uh, fired, who then was accused of, you know, originally the story was, yeah, that guy, I was just helping him out. He had, you know, gambling debts or whatever, and, mm -hmm. and they were paid off. And then the story was ultimately that the money was stolen from him, from Otani, the guy on the left. So what I would say is no matter what, Major League Baseball is absolutely going to try to hang on to this guy on the left, on Ot Otani. He is the greatest thing to happen to baseball in the modern age. And uh, and I, I even include Barry Bonds. I mean, this guy that you see, Otani, is a tremendous brand for Major League Baseball. So I don't know how this is all going to shake out, but I'm guessing somehow Otani's going to survive it. We'll see how. This report sponsored by CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. It is the most amazing coffee, the most amazing tea, and it is definitely a treat for yourself. You can get 10% off. It's fantastic. Yes, it is. it is. It's great. Get your 10% off by tar typing Mark T at checkout and experience a little bit of heaven in your Mark Thompson Show coffee cup. I get a little bit of heaven. A little bit it. of heaven for you. I'm Kim well McAllister. Put. This is the Mark Thompson Show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Shadow Stevens. This is the Mark Thompson Show. Keep it to yourself. Who's Mark Thompson? What up, everybody? Hour two. We're really excited. There's a lot of going on. There's a great guest ahead, so you really got to stay in for that. But now, now I can't believe it. I Mark's love it. Madness. Mark's Madness well underway, and what a good one we've got going. Yeah. You'll vote right now in the live chat, either for Ch -ch -ch or for Fauci. That's not fake. That's real. Oh, yeah. It is. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Chit, 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 or... That's not fake. That's real. 
Voting until the end of the show in the chat, but then until midnight tonight in the community section of our YouTube channel. Good luck! Wow, this is really, really close. Many people have picked Chit 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 to go all the way. We will see. But now I uh, turn our attention to something fascinating. The Mark Thompson Show. There's a new book out. It's called Suspicious Activity. And it's co-authored by Christopher Paulus, who's joining us now. This is, and I think it's fair to say, a legal thriller. You see it on the um, cover right there. Mike Papantonio and Christopher Paulus wrote this together. Both of them were steeped with knowledge in the law, with anti-terrorism, with litigating some of the largest cases against pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they look at government fraud. They have, between them, so much experience that they draw on to weave this tale that it's a fascinating read, and you learn a lot along the way. How about it for Christopher Paulus? Look at you, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? Very well, sir. Thank you. Um, let me just explain who you are. I normally don't, you know, read word for word, but there's so much here. <laughs> um, attorney and partner at the Levin Pampantonio um, Raff, uh, it's Levin Pampantonio Rafferty. Those are the partners in the firm in, in which you're, you're, you're operating. That's and right. you litigate some of the largest and most complex pharmaceutical, medical device, environmental mass torts, as well as government fraud, federal false claim act cases. With the San Diego County Public Defender's Office and in private practice, you have handled matters involving organized crime, drug trafficking, and sophisticated fraud now you lead the firm's counterterrorism litigation team, spearheading some of the country's most cutting-edge cases, holding those who commit and support terrorism wherever they may be found accountable for their heinous acts. That's what's in your bio, and I just wanted to make sure it all got out because I feel as though there's a lot there. Now let me just speak to how some of that, and then you can really contextualize it for us, but I learned a lot in this book, and one of the things I learned about was these IEDs, and, and there's a and this the whole thing and the the tale involves banking and money laundering and all this stuff. But the at it the thing that jumped out right away that I just didn't know about was there are different kinds of these IEDs and EFPs, and the EFPs are particularly brutal. I wonder if you could just uh, start with talking about this and then i'll get into the court case and a little bit of the yarn itself please absolutely um well the book suspicious activity uh focuses on a, uh, a particular type of efp that was being used uh in iraq and afghanistan against u.s troops and coalition troops um and the explosively formed penetrator is the is what the acronym efp stands for um and those were ieds that started to be used against our troops in iraq um, sometime in about mid to uh, early to mid 2004. And, and they were essentially game changers in, in terms of the, the insurgency that started to blossom in Iraq at that time. Um, they're highly sophisticated uh, explosive devices that take uh, a very uh, expert knowledge to create and then to actually uh, su successfully deploy uh, with lethal effect. Um, and it turns out that those types of uh, improvised explosive devices were developed by Hezbollah um, uh, in the late 90s um, and ended up being seen in the battlefield in, in Iraq because of the Hezbollah and Iranian connection to some of the militant groups that were targeting and attacking coalition forces at the time. Um, those types of IEDs are uh, exponentially more lethal um, and more effective in penetrating certain types of armor and overcoming counter IED uh, contingency uh, uh, devices that that our our troops had, and uh, they are, you know, the numbers have shifted, particularly uh, in hindsight. But at least 700 of our troops were killed by explosively formed penetrators, specifically, and many more by the groups that were receiving that type of material support from state and non-state actors. One of the things that 
you know, there's so many things that you lay out in your book that are so instructive and learning so much just by looking at some of the facts that you weave into the story. One of the things I learned is something that you just referenced, which is that there, it seems for every technology that the insurgency has, like the, uh, the terrorist insurgency has, these uh, uh, IEDs, for example, um, we come up with, that is the Americans, uh, the fighting force there in Iraq, come up with some way to either handle it, anticipate it, uh, et cetera. But with these EFPs, as you just said, they're so much more lethal and destructive. And you actually go into the, you break down what, you know, what happens with these things. Um, and as you've just noted, there really isn't a way to anticipate them the way you could the IEDs. Yeah, the you know, the sophistication of the EFP, um, the triggering mechanisms, and and the, the various ways that those evolved in order to uh, defeat our counter IED defeat uh, techniques um, it, were incredibly nefarious, very sophisticated, um, and it was uh, the only reason that that was achievable on the ground in Iraq against our troops is because of an enormous amount of both monetary but expertise support, um, su uh, having access to the military grade plastic explosives that were used to power an EFP, the types of metals that are used to actually uh, mill to very tight specifications, the tolerances required to make the warheads in, uh, in those uh, types of weapons. You know, it's almost a misnomer, an improvised explosive device, because these things were very purposefully built. Uh, they weren't improvised, they weren't just cooked up in someone's garage. Uh, they were expertly created and then frighteningly expertly distributed throughout the whole of Iraq to be used against our troops. And now to then that nexus of those things, the what you just alluded to, the amount of expertise, the supplies needed, the way in which you'd have to ramp up production would be expensive. Can you speak now to the banking connection and the way that these awful things are linked sadly to banks around the world? Yeah, um, you know, this is what we go to uh, go into in our book is that in order to do uh, to uh, basically launch a campaign of terror, uh, particularly with EFPs against uh, U.S. troops or other sophisticated uh, trained military uh, targets, you need to have uh, an, an enormous amount of uh, supply chain in terms of money, uh, in terms of access to personnel willing to to do, to. Uh, plant and replace these IDs to make the IDs. Um, you know, the military grade explosives are expensive, the copper is expensive, uh, the payment along the chain of distribution is, is expensive. Um, and then just access to those materials is difficult to do, particularly if you're a group that's being targeted and hunted around the globe. Um, and so you have to have an infrastructure that available to you. And one of the key components of that infrastructure for any terrorist organization is going to be the financial uh, component. You need to be able to move money around. You need to be able to access funds. And you need to be able to access goods or, or materials that you shouldn't be able to access. And uh, that's often done with the complicity of financial institutions, whether it be transferring money or giving you letters of credit or access to trade finance transactions to access goods or materials that you need to run your organization to commit terrorism. And that's something that you talk about in the book. So the uh, it's a fictitious bank in the book, but I wonder if you can speak to in real life, though, it's, this is all informed by real life and, 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 it, and it's, it's compelling for that reason, I think, among others. Can you speak to the real life part of this? And then maybe, I mean, you have sort of just touched on it, but I wonder if you can, I mean, I'll ask the point, I'll ask the point blank. Are there American banks involved in terrorism and the somehow laundering or handling money for uh, even if it's on down the chain for groups that are associated with terrorism. Absolutely. There are banks in the United States. Um, they're global financial institutions with branches in, and uh, subsidiaries here in the United States, often um, in and around New York, where you know it's one of the global uh, financial uh, epicenters um, with correspondent banking branches there in New York. Um, First and foremost, uh, terrorism is, uh, is, is a business and run as a business by those who, who lead those organizations. And the uh, currency of choice is the dollar. Um, and so uh, to access U.S. currency, um, to uh, have sophisticated global transactions uh, take place, you need to usually run through a correspondent bank here in the United States. 
Um, so the, the people, places, and, and events of our book are, are fictitious, but they're based on real life situations um, that have been admitted to by banks in some circumstances, that are the results of prosecutions done by the Department of Justice, or are similar to the fact patterns that we see in the cases that we handle on the civil side, representing those victims of terrorism who are seeking to hold the, the infrastructure of terrorism accountable. In your book, you have, uh, you know, the it's sort of a similar parallel. I associate, I associate your real life with a little bit of uh, what's going on in the book. You know, you have the investigators, the, the legal side, you know, the lawyer, investigator, and and investigator. I, I'm really curious, uh, so I hate to keep kind of getting you back to real life, but uh, if you can just give me a sense for how uh, these discoveries that you made along the way with the uh, terrorism aided by U.S. banks and uh, these sort of moments of, oh my God, how they played out uh, in your own life, in your own investigations, because you've been involved in this for quite some time. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, you know, a good example from our book uh, is that uh, Deke, uh, Deke, the main lawyer character that, that was uh, uh, developed by Mike Papantonio in his series of books, um, uh, becomes aware of this type of case through uh, a whistleblower, through uh, an insider in the bank who happens to also be a U.S. veteran service member um, and with some expertise in uh, explosive ordnance disposal. And uh, that is how the lawyer in that book becomes uh, aware of it. Uh, in real life, we often uh, receive inf uh, information like that from somebody who's within an institution or within an organization that sees something happening uh, has tried to run it up the, the chain of command and is either retaliated against or sent to corporate Siberia and then reaches out to an attorney to see what their rights and how uh, are and how they can be protected in reporting that information. Um, with a lot of the, the banking and inf uh, the information about banks being involved in terrorism, um, you know, that's it, you know, certainly after 9-11, the financial, uh, the role of the financial sector in terrorism became I think much more apparent. There were many laws that were passed that uh, tried to stamp out the financial flow of terrorism. Um, but at the same time, those laws put our banks at the at the front lines of preventing terrorism. Um, banks are in a unique position to report suspicious activities within their accounts so that terrorism can be stopped and that that money can be prevented from flowing into the wrong hands. And uh, what we've seen both in the headlines and also in our book is that banks uh, often get to a crossroads and choose the wrong path. Uh, that is to become more complicit or knowledgeable, turn a blind eye to illicit activities because it's generating so many profits for them. Um, and that's uh, certainly something that we've seen in real life. And the other thing that you uh, touch on is the way in which um, there are um, outside interests and even Iranian interests that are using domestic uh, handmaidens here in this country to do a lot of the stuff that they need to do in this country. Uh, yeah, certainly. I, I mean, I think uh, I think a lot of people who are paying attention uh, to the headlines every day uh, understand that there are outside state actors that have an interest in the, in the inner workings of, of our country and our government, the trajectory of our country. Um, and are doing things uh, uh, through technologies to have an influence on that. Um, you know, the banking industry is, is certainly no exception. Um, it is as just as digital as any other uh, current technology. Um, and there uh, are ways that it can be manipulated or uh, certain safeguards can be defeated through uh, expert techniques and structuring transactions. And uh, that's you know, really one of the, the centerpieces of, of the story in our book is how uh, certain things that banks were uh, basically deputized to do can actually then be used by those who are supposed to be the watchdog to allow uh, certain folks to get around those safeguards. And um, so it's, uh, it's unfortunately something that, that, that folks get very sophisticated at. And then almost just like the IED situation where something then doesn't start to get work, uh, doesn't work any longer, or they get caught doing something, they simply just evolve their techniques to make it easier to keep the, the pipeline open. Uh, I have a question from uh, one of our viewer listeners. Robert says, can the financial transactions be predicted or is it just determined after the fact? Now, I wonder about that. 
Uh, well, I think there the the ways in which uh, transactions can be structured are, are predictable. Um, uh, you know, it's a system that has you know certain certain ways that transactions are can be can be layered um, or uh, disguised. Um, but the suspicious activity reports, and that's where where the title of our book comes from, is that banks have an obligation to report suspicious activity. They also have an obligation to know their customer and to actually know the beneficiaries of the accounts that they have. Um, and they know their customers better than anybody. Um, and they certainly have the ability to predict how their own systems and how their, their procedures at their bank uh, can be used for terrorism. Um, and they most certainly shouldn't be teaching people who could use uh, how to get around those safeguards that they've implemented and are, are deputized to police themselves. Um, but that's what we've seen. We've seen that banks have actually created departments that are designed to handle, quote unquote, their high risk uh, accounts, and that those departments charge premiums for them to be able to, to conduct transactions without being screened by OFAC or other financial watchdogs or, or flagged as suspicious. Um, and so uh, being able to predict a transaction, we know what money, we know what terrorists need money for, um, the, we know how they've used the financial system in the past, but we're always trying to play catch up. Um, they're always trying to, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, seal a leak in, in, in the dam, so to speak. And when you put your finger in one crack, it starts to, to squirt out another one. So it, it's a little bit of whack-a-mole. Uh, it's interesting though, when you talk about the fact that the banks have a, a kind of fork in the road and they make the decision to take the route that may be the mistake, Josh points out, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors. And that's kind of what you have sort of uh, implied with your answer, which is, yeah, th and that's exactly why they make these decisions, because they're the money making decision as opposed to the responsible decision. Absolutely. Um, and in and, and some of the Senate investigations that took place uh, in the later 2000s, particularly the HSBC banking investigation, it, it, the headlines really dealt with more cartel money, but they were doing this exact same thing for terrorist organizations like Hezbollah. And uh, they uh, essentially make that calculation. In the documents that were released to those investigations, you see them talking about the potential for reputational harm and risk. And that's exactly what they're talking about in those emails is they are weighing the threat of to their bottom line on whether or not they'll get caught doing what they're doing, knowing that they're the ones that are hiding it, and, uh, and the money that they're gonna be making from handling those types of transactions. Wow. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's brutal. It's just as it was just posted on the screen from one of our viewers, the banks must know this. Yeah. They, you know, on some level they do. And it's, yeah. And they have a duty to know it. That's they, they have taken the position that they will assist in, in stamping out terrorism and drug trafficking and human trafficking and not allow their banks to be used for these types of illicit activities. And so it's, it's a conscious decision for them to, to do what they're doing. You are suing Iran. The, That's um, the idea is that Iran created these uh, EFPs. They're these brutal, I mean, IEDs and EFPs. I, I love the thing, the point you made, which is improvised makes it sound kind of like it was just uh, slapped together in, you know, somebody's hut. But the reality is it's super sophisticated and super destructive. And in your book, you have the sweet souls who've been, you know, uh, damaged by these things. And it's discussed um, explicitly. And you also meet them, you see the, the faces of some of the people in real life, I understand the book is, uh, you know, a fictional account. Anyway, you're suing Iran for these things. And uh, I, I'm wondering how that works. Can you just give us I know it's probably super complicated, but can you give us a sense of uh, how that works? Uh, yeah, I'll try to try to keep it as simple as I can. So uh, first, you have to start with that from the get go, uh, a foreign sovereign nation is usually immune to uh, the U.S. laws. Um, and there is what is called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act that says that uh, another foreign country is immune from suit in the United States. But there are five exceptions. And one of those exceptions is uh, terrorism um, and uh, specifically for state sponsors of terrorism uh, that are designated through executive order and other executive branch uh, uh, procedures. So for state sponsors of terrorism, if they either commit an act of extrajudicial killing, a hostage taking, uh, airline uh, uh, hijacking, certain enumerated acts, 
uh, if they either you know, commit those acts or provide material support to those acts, they no longer enjoy the benefit of sovereign immunity within uh, the United States uh, court system or judicial system. And so uh, we, uh, US victims of terror can seek justice through our courts if they are victims of terrorism that was materially supported by uh, a state sponsor of terror, such as Iran. And so with that, they, we, uh, our courts will strip Iran of its immunity and allow uh, victims of terror to proceed into litigation with their cases. Um, so that's that's kind of the procedural mechanism that, uh, that allows us to bring those types of lawsuits. And then going through the actual process of getting Iranian money is associated with freezing assets, knowing where their assets are, and then getting those assets to uh, essentially um, uh, handle the handle the complaint once their judgment's made to handle a judgment. Yeah, that, that's correct. So, uh, you know, Iran strategically takes a default in, in these in these cases. Um, and I, I liken it to it's 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 additional terrorism on top of their terrorism. Um, if Iran if the United States sues an oil tanker or seizes a uh, seizes a bank or or is a commercial or contractual dispute, Iran will show up in court every day, um, and they will defend itself and they will they will uh, you know uh, vigorously litigate those cases. But they gaslight victims of terrorism um, and they rob victims of terrorism the opportunity to conduct discovery against it directly to depose and take testimony of uh, of those that may have harmed them or been. Uh, involved in in the decisions and the actions that that led to certain terrorist attacks or the support of certain groups, um, and so uh, what uh, usually will end up happening is that we do conduct discovery against non parties, third parties, and and others that that have potential evidence that often includes the government, Department of Defense, Department of State as well, um, and we build the case uh, brick by brick without Iran there. Um, the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act doesn't just allow you to if they don't show up, you don't get an automatic uh, an automatic judgment. That actually puts the the federal judge that's overseeing that case in the seat as the fact finder, and the statute says uh, expressly that your evidence has to prove every element of your claim to the satisfaction of that judge, um, and so you will get a full judicial review of the evidence available to you to see if you can establish your claim against Iran. At which point, if you do, they will enter judgment. You can use that judgment to execute uh, writs of execution or to seek writs of execution against assets around the globe. Um, and uh, recently, uh, fairly recently, in 2015, the United States government set up uh, what it call, what's called the United States Victim of State Sponsored Terror Fund, where the, a judgment holder, uh, that is a victim of, of terrorism with a judgment against the state sponsor of terror, can apply to that fund to have a portion of their judgments repaid. Um, and that fund has you know, made four payments to date. Um, it's funded by uh, the actual civil and criminal penalties that are realized through our government's prosecution of violations of the International Economic Powers Act and, and sanctions. So uh, there's a lot in the news these days about Russian sanctions and certain sanctions being placed on individuals, organizations, and those things. So if uh, the United US government, Department of Justice prosecutes, let's just say uh, somebody who makes radio transceivers that end up in, in roadside bombs, uh, and they successfully prosecute that uh, that uh, company or the individual doing that, and they obtain a civil or criminal penalty through those efforts. A certain portion, a large portion, majority of that uh, money is supposed to go to the fund. Um, there's been some situations uh, where the DOJ may, you know, have made a questionable decision about whether or not the funds go to the fund. Um, but uh, those monies fund the fund, and when there is sufficient amount of money in the fund, those claims can be paid. So uh, it used to be 20, 30 years ago that these default judgments or judgments obtained against uh, either the terrorist organizations themselves or state sponsor of terror were, were much harder for victims to actually see some compensation that could potentially make them whole. Um, you, you know, that's that's how the, our justice system works is we can't bring anybody back. We can't, you know, give anybody a new arm or leg um, like they had before, but we can at least try to give them uh, compensation to make their lives better and as whole as they could, could possibly be. So yeah, and Iran thought, cares about that money. So, but but you know that's that's why those sanctions matter. They they don't want assets freezed. And you know it's a uh, uh, look. You're the you're the guy on this. I'm glad we touched on it because you're literally. I was looking. You're the foremost legal expert on suing Iran for terrorist attacks, and uh, 
using these these devices, these IEDs and 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 EFPs, and getting the people who were um, who were maimed by these things uh, some kind of compensation. As you say, it doesn't right or wrong, but it uh, uh, it's a it's a remarkable world, and I just didn't honestly know about it. I mean, to the extent that you discuss it and then you weave it into this yarn, and it's really great, Chris. Congratulations on this book, and I guess you've done it with. Um, Mike Pompantonio, who is a an experienced uh, b- both um, writer and lawyer as well, right? Absolutely. This book is just one of several that Mike uh, has has published um, that uh, is essentially based on our experiences. It's fictionalized uh, uh, for uh, the everyday reader to kind of understand the types of legal issues that that law firms like mine are are, are handling every day um, and. Uh, it, we, you know, I, th- I believe we, we're putting them out so that uh, folks can understand what's actually going on in the in, in the world in a fiction in, in a fictional setting, and be a little bit more aware of of how our legal system can be used for the better. Unreal, unreal. Good luck with the book. Congratulations again. It's suspicious activity. We'll drop this as a separate video. We'll have a link to the book and to uh, places to buy the book. And uh, we wish you all the best for that really fascinating conversation. I'd love for you to come back sometime. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Christopher Paulus. The Mark Thompson Show. Wow. He's the real thing. That it, It's a good read. And I really am both intrigued by this world. And I am so uh, educated in that world through, uh, through his book. Pretty wild. Uh, you know, I lose track of the time because I'm into the conversation. Do you understand what's going on? Yeah. I don't watch the clock no, because I'm yeah. into... Do you know who I am? Thank you. I'm kind of a big deal. Exactly. When it's a good conversation, you want that to happen. Thank yeah. you. And so that's the reason we we tend to run a little behind. It's okay. Get, now, but there are no other guests coming, right? That's No, that was it. That's okay, pretty so, good. I mean, I do, we had some good, good guests today, I have to oh, say. I'd say we had super guests. Yeah. Um, uh, honestly, it, 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 was, it, it was great. It was great. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to do, though, is um, I have actually a lot of really important stuff that I wanted to pass, and I think really interesting stuff that I wanted to pass along to you mm. uh, still. And so I am... Um, Faced with what I'm always faced with, which is how to get it all in, and still do. Now, Mark Madness. Madness. Mark's Madness. Come on, everybody. This is the big one. Take a look. This one's expected maybe to win the whole tournament. You either vote for chit chit chit, or you vote for the Fouch. That's not fake. Mm. That's real. Yeah. So you vote either chit chit, right? Or that's not fake. That's real. You can vote live in the chat now until the top of the hour, and then you go to the community section of our YouTube channel. You can vote there until midnight tonight. Wow. Now, Tony, have you become aware of um, where Mark's Madness was um, in the... On Friday, we left you, and um, just trying to see what... um, what happened? There's now really only one person with a perfect bracket now. Jennifer Vesper. Perfect bracket. Wow. Go, Jennifer, go. Yeah. They're, uh, after that, it's Sally and Matt and Nancy, all with uh, and Michael Snyder, the culture blaster, 14 and 1. But Jennifer's 15 and 0. Pretty incredible. Yeah. After that, you get on down the way and uh, more toward like people like me. <laughs> I'm 12 and three, but there are a bunch of 13 and two, and and I'll tell you, there's anybody could win this still, as long as you're the one you want to have win the championship is still in the hunt, then you're okay. Um, but anything happened over the weekend, Tony, that I needed to know on this? I wanted to see if um, how it all worked out with um, on Friday. What was playing off on Friday? It was. Um, my uh, bad was playing off against um no it was i'm sorry tube and apology was uh playing off against Kasem all the time mm-hmm. classic time waster was playing off against where my weed where my weed and tube moved on 
My bad, I'm sorry, beat out, let him finish, sir. Grady situation, lost to 30 to 35% idiots. That was an upset. Um, it's kind of kind of wild to see the upsets have not, I don't know, I consider, I thought the 30 to 35%. There's always been would, in this country, hmm. 30 to 35% idiots. I thought that was going to lose to... Um, Grady situation, but it beat Grady situation. So that was uh, what he's got going you know, here is a situation. Good for you, thirty to thirty-five percent idiots. My bad. I'm sorry. No surprise. Seriously, what the f? I mean, that is of course. Seriously, a, what yeah. the? F- that beat out. Um, cannot say you love my con- uh, your country. Never been anything like it against cheaper, better. That was a Trump on Trump, and never been anything like it. Uh, won that. So anyway, now we're. Um, into you know the the next round and you know it's getting the competition is getting tougher so this is very exciting i hope you're even if you're not you don't need a bracket you can vote just by being in the chat by being one of the people in our community vote for the one that you want to move on you can see this chit 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 all the way says murphy ron a lot of people think chit 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 is is going to be rocking the show, Kim. Wow. Yeah. Um, and right I think now, it's you uh, that's love not it or fake. Mm. That's real. Okay. You know, it's one of those things. You think what? You either love it or you hate it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't. You know, there are. You're right. I think it falls into the category yeah. of. I got a couple of. Uh, I guess I'll save them the emails for tomorrow. But got a couple of emails and. Uh, somebody's always mentioning, I don't like this. I don't, yeah, you know, it's a, I got a, I got the, I love you, but I've received a lot of positive letters. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll get to that, but chit, chit, chit again. So that's not fake. That's what's going down this hour until the end of the hour. So one of the two, that's not fake. That's real. You uh, vote on to the next round. Kim, will you give us a little bit of, uh, some headlines and what's happening in the world? To. I'm glad and you then, asked. Um, mm-hmm. and then I have uh, some stuff to share with you as well. Smash the like button. If you would. It is how we stay alive <laughs> in the algorithm of YouTube. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister. This report sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Former President Trump says he will pay cash to secure a bond now that an appeals court has lowered the amount as he appeals his New York civil fraud trial. The court lowered the bond from $454 million down to $175 million today. You know, $175 mil, much more doable. Uh, gave him also 10 days to make that payment happen. Trump claimed again today he is the victim of a corrupt judge and an attorney general he called a thug. That's no, well, well. He's, yeah. uh, he, he likes to smack talk for sure. He really does. Do they take those uh, Bed Bath & Beyond 20% off coupons? I wonder. They, he, I got a lot of yeah. those I could give him. Yeah, you know. he might need the help. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is scrapping plans to send a delegation to Washington this week. The State Department spokesman Matthew Miller called the move surprising and unfortunate. Netanyahu's decision comes after the United States decided against vetoing a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. The Texas Department of Homeland Security is clarifying how they would enforce a new immigration law. If it's allowed to go into effect, a spokesperson says troopers would only arrest illegal migrants they see crossing the Rio Grande and would not check a driver's immigration status during traffic stops. A federal appeals court has put that law on hold as all these lawsuits play out. So we'll see how uh, what ends up happening there. There's a lot of organizations that are getting a big infusion of cash, especially here in California. And that is because Mackenzie Scott is making a lot of, uh, uh, I should say, a large amount of donations. I'm looking for my picture, didn't have it. Nearly 80 California organizations are getting this boost. They are among 361 charities nationwide sharing $640 million. That's how much philanthropist Mackenzie Scott just donated in her latest round of contributions. She is the third richest woman in the country, was married to Amazon founder Jeff Bezos for nearly 25 years. She split from him in 2019 with 30 
$38 billion in Amazon stock, vowing to give most of it away. The 76 charities here include Foundation for a College Education, Next Generation Scholars, and Inner City Struggle. She seems pretty cool. Yeah, she does. Yeah. I mean, you know, giving it all away like that and picking education and things that people care about. I, 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 I like it. Um, Shohai Otani, a little bit more about what's happening. Now we know that Mr. Otani is expected to speak at 2.45 Pacific time is when we can expect more information about well, I know he won't be speaking through that interpreter no, anymore. He won't. <laughs> but but that He's... interpreter's name may come up. He's expected to address the media for the first time since allegations of illegal gambling and theft involving his former interpreter surfaced. So again, the press conference scheduled for 2.45 p.m. at Dodger Stadium, Pacific Time, 15 minutes before the start of batting practice ahead of the Dodgers game against Otani's former club, the Los Angeles Angels. Major League Baseball starting a formal investigation into the gambling accusations as well. This mm. interpreter accused of receiving more than $4.5 million dollars from this Dodger superstar to pay wow. off gambling debts made with an illegal bookie. Are any bookies legal? Because yeah, you know. are a cover up <laughs> artist and you are a liar. Yeah, I, mean, I think illegal it, bookie redundant. I don't know. Right. It mm. seems as though somebody was in deep to the book. That's for sure. The Dodgers fired the interpreter after the LA Times reported on the case. And meanwhile, a lot of people are telling me you're a liar. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> the interpreter. <laughs> Accused yeah. of burning through the millions of, of Otani's money no. may have overstated his qualifications. Oh. It paid yes, sir. <laughs> oh, wow. Ipe Mizuhura's Major League Baseball bio says he received a degree from UC Riverside, but the school is disputing whether Mizuhara ever even attended there. There are what? also discrepancies about dates and whether Mizuhara was even or was ever the interpreter for another Japanese player uh, for either the New York Yankees or the Boston Red Sox. The dates in his bio and the tenure of the player with each team just don't line up. Oh my God. And this is their new house. Oh, <laughs> what is going on in the United States of America? <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Okay, so uh, a lot of things don't add up. But again, 2.45 this afternoon, we'll figure out a little more. It's, I think it's, we're, we're in popping stat, uh, territory is where we are. Yeah. We're, we're in, getting, oh, this thing's about to pop, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Lotto fever growing, of course, as the Mega Millions and the Powerball jackpots are swollen. Oh, An yeah. estimated $800 million on the line for tonight's Powerball drawing alone. Uh, Mega Millions, though, up to $1.1 billion, the jackpot. So, wow. That's I know. A it's money. a lot. You know, we're not going to win it, but somebody might. And so, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know. Might as well play. You, it's two dollars for a little bit of dreaming. <laughs> if you, it takes you a little dream, it gives you a little love. That's good. Yeah, I mean, if you enjoy it, if that'll, if that little bit of hope will keep you going through the night, sure. Right. Why not? I mean, why not? Might as well do it. Footloose. They are celebrating at the high school where Footloose was filmed. Have you heard about this? But I guess they're closing down that high school because they're building a new high school in this area where the movie was filmed. And it's in Utah. It's Payson High School where Footloose was filmed. And they're having their final prom this year at this high school. And oh, they thought, strange. we need Kevin Bacon to come to our prom. And so they have this big campaign trying to get him to attend this year's event because the school is relocating and you know their claim to fame being the school where the movie was filmed will be over. They had a social media campaign. It was a collective effort. Students got involved in movie recreations. They like, you know, re reenacted videos from the Footloose movie and the dances and everything. It got his attention. And he says he will come to that last prom. Wow. What? Oh, yeah. my God. Thompson, party of four. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You can join my party. So he makes this big announcement uh, broadcast on the Today Show, and he thanked the students for their invitation. He said the film and the high school is a big part of his life, and all the students were gathered together at the school for the announcement. There were cheers, a lot of things. So he's going to the prom, Kevin Bacon, wow, at the Payson High School prom. Wow, that is terrific. There's mm. never been anything like this. That is, I don't think there has been anything like that. Kind of before. exciting. Yeah. Exciting for them, you know, to have a star there.
Oh my God! I mean, can you imagine a yeah. prom with celebrity showing up like that? There is Kevin nothing Bacon. in our history that quite compares exactly. to this. Okay, I, think we I bet they part. all know the Footloose dance, and I bet they're all going to do it together. And oh sing. yeah, the yeah, Footloose it's... dance. Good thinking. Yeah. Mm. This report sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Get your ten percent off. You call them and say, "Smash it with your iron rod." Mm-hmm. Call Rich out at the Vineyard, 925-699-4576, 925-699-4576. So many good wines. They have 14 reds. They have 14 whites. They have the Mark Thompson, Why Are You Yelling Red? So many good things about Tenuta Vineyard. So again, get your 10% off. Make sure when you get your wine on your porch that you've uh, that you've got your discount, your Mark Thompson Show exclusive discount by yeah. saying, smash it with your iron rod. Mm-hmm. And I'll get you. It's the phrase that pays. It'll get you your. It's 10% the phrase off. that pays. Everybody <laughs> say it. We call you. You can say also the phrase that pays. You can also email Rich. By the way, Rich at Tenuta T E N U T A Vineyard dot com. Love I'm it. I'm Kim, Kim McAllister. It's the Mark Thompson Show. Hey, which one you use, Mark Thompson? Use Mark Thompson. The Mark Thompson Show. Right on, everybody, right on. I'm right here with you all. Come to me. I wish I could take you all home with me. <laughs> Thank you for being part of our world. We appreciate it. We're a crowdfunded effort. We have uh, little sponsorships that help us uh, defray some small costs, but essentially we wouldn't exist without the crowd that funds us. And that's all Patreon and PayPal primarily, and the people who are generous enough in the moment to throw us a super sticker, super chat. You guys are just the grooviest and we are in the middle of something that we do every year mark's madness it's a mark's madness and this is the drop that is expected to win that's going off today it's either uh the chit 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 Ch -ch -chit. it's at 66 percent of the vote right now in the live chat or the fauci drop that's not fake that's real and that's not fake that's real so it's uh Ch -ch -chit. or fauci that's not fake that's real. Chit, 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 or that's not fake. You can vote in the community section till midnight. And that's a community section on our YouTube channel. You go to YouTube, you'll see in our channel, you go to Mark Thompson Show channel, you'll see live, shorts, videos, community. And there will be the poll. But right now, chit, chit, chit looks unbeatable. Wow. We will see. All right. I want to give you some, so I'm going to do it. Here's some law and disorder. In the criminal justice system, the people... Pimps, addicts, thieves, bums, winos, girls who can't keep an address, and men who don't care... ...are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. A cop, a flatfoot, a bull, a dick, John Law, you're the fuzz, the heat, you're poison, you're trouble, you're bad news. These are their stories. Major law that may go into effect in Florida restricting minors' access to social media it's essentially a social media ban for minors you know people who are not yet of age not the not minors of coal and of uh, precious metals but those minors and a new version of this law that they've been trying to get through the Ron DeSantis version the original one was really restrictive this one is a little less restrictive and this bill uh, was passed by the House there in Florida, 109 to 4. This is a top priority for Republican Speaker Paul Renner's 60-day session that ends in the next week. The bill will ban social media accounts for children under 14 and require parental permission for 15- and 16-year-olds. DeSantis... Um, is behind this and his administration in Florida, which is, you know, you associate with freedoms, right? They didn't like COVID restrictions. They didn't like uh, mandates of any kind. They didn't like um, the masks. They viewed Florida as like the last bastion of personal freedom. Their view is, at least implied in this legislation, is those freedoms kick in when you're 18, not until then. Mm -hmm. Quote, we know that social media is the main platform for sexual crimes against children. We know that it's a place where they're bullied online, where their self-image is torn down online. It leads them to major mental health issues, contemplation of suicide, acts of self-harm, 
spikes in anorexia, and the list goes on and on. And for that reason, this is legislation we want on the books. Several states have considered similar legislation. Arkansas um, had a um, federal judge actually step in and block enforcement in that state of, of a similar kind of social media restriction. So, uh, look, there are going to be some legal challenges to this in Florida for sure, but the effects of social media on young people, that's not really in dispute. I mean, it's not a good thing. Uh, the degree to which you can restrict access, that's something that reasonable minds can differ on. But in Florida, it may very well, as they say, you overwhelmingly passed. It may withstand legal challenge, but there oh, will be legal challenge. I have a question. I thought Florida was like the parents' rights state, right? Parents have a right to decide what their children read it's in the library. We're going to ban all the books and parents have a right to decide about vaccines. Well, don't parents have the right then to decide about social media? Yeah, I mean, and- I say this as someone who doesn't let their children have social media, right? So I, I'm on board with it. But I mean, that was my choice. I'm just saying, like, does that not go against what their whole thing is? Well, their their thing is just that. I think when the child is 15 or 16, but before that, you're not allowed to have it. Mm. It, it, you know, the, the state of Florida has decided you're not allowed yeah. to have it. But, but to your point, they have made the point that there will be parental involvement at 15 and 16. Mm-hmm. In other words, that that's when the door opens to this whole world, but only with parental um, involvement. It's a it's tricky, as I say, because the deleterious effects of this social media stuff is it's demonstrable. I mean, you kind of know Ooh, that deleterious, deleterious and demonstrable, a, and double demonstrable. whammy. Yeah. yeah. Um, a senior leader of the MS-13 street gang was one of the FBI's most wanted gang fugitives was arrested, everyone. That's right. He's been arrested at the California-Mexico border on narco-terrorism charges. There he is, Freddy Ivan Andres Parada. He's 48 years old. He's also known as Lucky De Park View. Uh, okay. I didn't make it up. That's just what he, uh, I'm just saying. What? Uh, 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 yeah, again, I didn't make it up. That's just what he, it, it's an AKA. I mean, when you're a drug kingpin, you need a nickname like El Chapo had a nickname. This mm-hmm. guy needs a good nickname. Lucky De Park View is not a good name. I guess you call no. him Lucky. But anyway. I mean, um, it's pleasant. That's a, a nice view of the park, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Lucky to park you. <laughs> it's not threatening. It's not <laughs> ominous. You know. Yeah, exactly. So um, federal officials did not disclose any details about the arrest except to say that he was taken in by federal authorities. And um, this is after three years of looking for this guy on terrorism offenses related to the direction of MS-13's criminal activities in the U.S., El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and I'm sorry I have to do this, Lucky, but um, it is a bylaw of the show that we have to read your booking photo. And on the Mark Thompson Show booking photo meter, uh, I'm only giving you a four, sir. Yeah. I'm sorry. And please don't um, take it out on me. Do you agree, Kim? I'd say a four. Yeah, that's a poor, that's a poor, uh, poor photo. Mm-hmm. Tony, you have to agree with me. I mean, I, I can't give him a higher score. Uh, I think four is about it. Uh, yeah, Tony, Tony's, a, like, you can see him. Tony's, um, no? Okay. No. Um, Tony doesn't want a, any issues with the cartel. I don't blame him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, meantime, as this guy cools his heels, there is a bizarre fact in a Maryland town. A Maryland town, this is a small place, Mm -hmm. 1,600 residents in Ridgely, Maryland. They are all living in a town that just suspended its entire police force. What? There is Uh, no one left. So then what do they have? Contract service out to the county? Residents of a small town in Maryland are demanding the truth. They don't know what happened. All the cops were ordered to step aside pending an investigation by the state prosecutor. The people have originally learned this in a terse, terse is a ding word, two-line announcement on the town's website that the 
three commissioners have suspended with pay the entirety of the Ridgely Police Department immediately. By the way, again, as we've reviewed on the show before, suspended with pay is the best way to be suspended. Yes. <laughs> if you're going to choose suspension, choose suspension with pay. The commissioners have been accused of treating their 1,600 citizens as children because they're not filling them in on the details. And there is no further information. It's a sleepy town just two miles from the Delaware border. It's best known for its annual winter festival. That draws thousands of visitors. They've recorded just four homicides since 2000. And residents really don't know what's up. It doesn't add up, says Jenny Wu, who lives there. She has a downtown business and has for more than 40 years. Everybody is skeptical about what happened. We just want to know how and why. There have been controversies involving the cops in this small town of Ridgely, Maryland. Uh, they had to pay a big settlement to a guy who's, uh, who died in police custody. They paid a $5 million settlement to his family. And there have been issues about misconduct and around controversies within the department. And so right now, nothing's been revealed, but it is possible that some of this was related to that. It's a developing story, as we say. And finally, in law and disorder, I think it's finally or close to finally, mm -hmm. Megan Hall, the ex-Tennessee cop, fired over sex trysts with six other officers. There she is getting a plaque for those sex trysts. You never <laughs> no. know. Yeah. This was a while ago, right? How long, how long ago was the firing? Um, well, she launched a lawsuit after her firing, and I believe the firing, I can get you the date here in a second, but she did uh, lose her job. And I just want to remind her, she, remind her, she had trysts with six other officers, but you had, the, oh, there they are. Thank you, Tony. Very, very good. That is who they are. Thanks, Tony. They have, uh, they're all handsome fellows. Doesn't look like she has a type. She uh, kind of uh, seemed to, you know, enjoy rolling around with these uh, various people. And as you know, perhaps from prior reports, I think some of which uh, we've shared with you here, some of it happened on the job, like while yeah. they were on the clock, you know, while the radio, police radio is going, they're rolling around on the What? Them. Yeah, just saying. She takes uh, all comers. <laughs> Megan Hall, who claims she was uh, sexually groomed by this cadre of male colleagues, and oh. cadre is a ding word, um, she sued the city of Laverne last year after a word of her raunchy romps made national headlines, and then she uh, actually won a settlement and the board of mayor and aldermen voting to authorize a settlement agreement between the city of Laverne and former officer Megan Hall. She looks so sweet there in that, in that picture, uh, enjoying a meal between sex trysts. Is that uh, yeah, good for her? I have no problem with it. I mean, I don't like it on the job, but um, hey, go for it. Um, but you're right, Kim, it's been about a year since this whole thing went down, and according to an internal investigation, she hooked up with several colleagues, sent them nude pictures, and went topless in a Girls Gone Wild-themed hot tub party, and even performed uh, various sex acts on two cops while on duty. What? Yeah, I'm sorry to end the show with this, uh, uh, shall we say, um, uh, description that uh, borders on uh, pornography, wow. but uh, there it is. But she's saying it's not her fault that she was, she was somehow groomed. manipulated into doing these things. Yeah. Okay. She also had a threesome with one of the cops and his wife, according to the report. Some of the dudes who you see there lost their jobs over this. And um, the investigation uh, was thorough and a report was issued. Wow, I bet that's a page turner, huh, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, they found that then police chief Burrell Chip Davis, who was fired over this scandal, not only knew about it, not only knew about Hall's hookups, but joked about the situation with others in the city. That's not cool. No, it is not. In any case, now she is getting half a million dollars for her time 
and she gets to keep those nude photos. So what? there is that all also uh, in the works. And finally, let me just mention one huge resignation at Boeing. I was going to do this as a story from the sky, but now I can just do it here in Law and Disorder because I think it falls into the disorder category. There is no place more disordered than Boeing at the moment. And the CEO of Boeing, along with other executives, stepping down. The company's been mired in these negative stories since that door panel blew out of that 737 MAX. And there he is, Dave Calhoun. He's going to be leaving the company by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Stan Deal, the CEO and president of Boeing Commercial Airplanes, has retired effective immediately. Larry Kellner, chair of the company's board of directors, is not going to stand for re-election at the next shareholders' annual meeting. And the Boeing board member and former Qualcomm CEO, Steve Mollenkopf, he will stay there and he will succeed Kellner. So despite a range of measures being announced by Boeing to improve safety and committing to working with federal investigators. As you know, there's a federal investigation in several different areas of Boeing right now, but um, resignations at Boeing because they just can't, this management team can't survive this. There's a clearly a crisis in management at Boeing. And that is Law and Disorder for today. Tune in again next time for more Law and Disorder on The Mark Thompson Show. All right, that's it. Let's roll. Hey, let's be careful out there. It's only my favorite time of year, everybody. Now, yeah! Mark's Madness. You know it. Mark's Madness with a sizzler going on. Look at it. Chit, chit, chit is crushing 66%. Chit, chit, chit. Yeah, chit, chit, chit is up against that's not fake. That's not fake. That's real. You can only vote for one. Chit, 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 or that's not fake. Chit, chit, chit. Or that's not fake. That's real. We're ending the show, so go to the community section now and vote till midnight. I'm very excited about the... Chit 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 prospects. I think that you and the chit 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 people <laughs> could be uh, winning this whole thing. I see it as a favor to win it all. The uh, number one seed in the tournament, I'll remind you, was Good Day Sir. Good Day Sir. That means a Good Day Sir won last year. But this year, I see chit 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 with a pretty good chance to, to well, do it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, uh, we'll see. Dominant victory right now over the Fouch. So, uh, congratulations on that. Uh, before I end things, I like to uh, take a measure of those who've been such a key part of today's show. And here is someone, Cindy, with a quick five spot. Big, Big shout, shout out. out. Thank you, Cindy. Monday's True Crime is one of the best weekly segments. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, I don't even like mm -hmm. true crime. And I agree with you. I actually enjoy it. So, uh, Luis. Big shout out. Chit, chit, chit will rule them all. That's not fake. <laughs> <laughs> Go chit, chit, chit. Yeah. And then Wes, such a regular supporter. Big shout Love out. Love our Wes. Thank you yeah. for the five spot, Wes. And appreciate that. Well, I think... Uh, we could stay longer, but I know you have a, a life to lead. In Kim's case, she has a show to do. I'm going back over to KFI today, Tony. Did I tell you that? I got to fill in for Conway. Oh, that's I was fine. there earlier oh, today. Right, good. So if you're in the Los <laughs> Angeles area or you want to check us out, we're there. And uh, Kim does the after party live. We'll do it live. Yeah. I can go, I'll write it and we'll do it live. I thought I'll write it and we'll do it live was going to do better in Mark's Madness. I thought it would advance one round. It didn't. It got taken down in the first round. There's no predicting this really, except I think Chit 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 is really going to do well. But um, congratulations to Jennifer, who is the only unbroken bracket, Jennifer Vesper. So. More tomorrow with David K. Johnston joining us. So until then, I'm Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Bye bye. Tony, thank you. Thanks, Tony. Kim, thank you. Kim, how are you? Long time. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody who supports us. Appreciate it. Till tomorrow. Bye bye.